Welcome to this session of the Qualitative Methods Masterclass webinar series. Today, Dr. John Olive, professor from the School of Nursing at the University of British Columbia, will be presenting qualitative research using visual methods. The recording of his presentation is missing about uh, 30 seconds. Uh, so you're going to see that there is something missing at the very beginning, but it's only a very short time, not more than 30 seconds. So thank you very much for joining us today. I, I, I guess part of the reason for that is that um, I just think the visual is really versatile. Um, you know, sort of, even when I was growing up, I was kind of like looking at images and, uh, and recognizing that, you know, health could be sold uh, to people. Um, Bad practices could be sold to people also, and I, I think big tobacco is one of the really interesting ones early on, especially in terms of thinking about work in, in gender and health, you know, the way that cigarettes were sold to women uh, as a, a kind of a beautification kind of product in some ways uh, at certain periods in history, but also, you know, I was struck by uh, how things like Virginia Slims were sold to, to women also as an act of independence, you know. Um, and uh, if you look at the, the middle picture there with uh, uh, Chrissy Everett uh, just in front of the signage, you know, the Virginia Slims Championship, you know, uh, Virginia Slims got involved in a, in a period of time when women weren't getting paid as much on the national uh, tennis circuit. Uh, they kind of appealed to women's sense of independence and their right to smoke. So, again, just the visualisation of how cigarettes and tobacco can be sold is, uh, is one example of how versatile it can be. You'll notice too on the NHS uh, um, picture there of the, of the woman who is, uh, is pregnant and the smoke coming out of her navel, uh, you know, to suggest that, you know, smoking in pregnancy is a women's health issue, uh, that it's deeply implicated in the health of the fetus, uh, in our ways of messaging against tobacco. So, the versatility of, of images has always been central, at least for me, in terms of looking at looking at health. It does a lot of other things as well. You know, I think that, that really, if you think about uh, the process, uh, it's very much process driven. I, I think, you know, growing up with photographs and sharing photographs to chronicle different aspects of our history, uh, the people in our lives. Uh, has always been a kind of a process around getting a narrative connected to photographs, so it seemed very natural. My point around it being ever present, um, I just think at the moment, it's, I don't think we've ever had a period of history that has been quite like this, where cameras are everywhere and images are everywhere. And in fact, the internet, you know, started out as kind of text heavy and we've really moved to video uh, plus or minus, you know, pictures, it's really taken over. And so I was reading an article just the other day and it was a celebrity suggesting that the autograph is dead, you know, because it's all about selfies now and when you meet a celebrity, you really want a selfie as the, as the proof that you've met them, it's not an autograph. And I, I think it's indicative of the fact that we're moving away from, from certain ways of knowing uh, into, uh, into images uh, like no other time. I think the visual is also robust. Um, I think it's terrific for capturing history, um, and I think it's, it, it's probably underutilised in health in terms of grounded theory and, and in terms of process. We've, we've tended to be quite cross-sectional in our use of, of, of pictures, um, but, but to say, you know, there's really good evidence that across periods of time you can see that it's quite a robust method for, for looking at change across time um, and for looking at process. So naming it has always been difficult. Um, we, we're doing revisions to a paper at the moment, and it's about photo voice. And, and one of the one of the reviewers' comments, which is very very good, um, just in case you're on the line, um, is to say uh, is to say that you know you, you name it as a certain thing, and then you are obliged to do that work. So the way we think about using visual methods. Um, uh, in health research is we think about it as photo elicitation and so photo elicitation simply means inserting a photograph into the interview and it could be a pre-existing photograph, it could be one of those photographs I've, I've shared earlier with a caption about Virginia Slims um, so to get a reaction to that or it could be a participant produced 
photographs. So when I look through the literature these days, I see a lot of kind of uh, different terms used. I'll share a couple with you. Auto photography from Thomas out of 2009, photo essay, Cornwin out of 1985, auto driving, Heasley and Levy on, on 1999, uh, auto photographs, photo voice, Wang and Burris, which is a pretty well known one that we often refer to, and I'll talk a little bit more about that and photo feedback. You know, I guess, um, you, you know, we are, we kind of like to be able to name things and, and, and like to be able to, to define them, and I think that's, I think that's okay. Um, we've really battled with it over, over the period of some of the 10 or 15 years that we've been using it because it's a moving target. It really seems to, to change depending on, you know, how people are using the method, but also, you know, naming it as a general photo elicitation or something more, more discreet. So in terms of photo voice, we we have proclaimed that we've done photo voice in some in some examples, and I'm happy to field questions about this because the chances are we probably haven't entirely stuck to the script about what photo voice has been said to do. It's participatory action in nature. It was really informed by you know empowerment, education, feminist theory, and documentary you know photography. And it was uh, the whole idea was that you could take an individual perspective, you could get it into a community level, and then at an institutional level, we, you know, in regards to policy, that you might have an impact on how people do business in, in regards to specific health issues. One of the classic studies was Wang and Barris out of, out of uh, 1994, and this was an interesting one because it was uh, it was uh, done in uh, in Beijing, in China, and it was uh, looking to empower rural women. In the in the Yan'an province in China to bring their concerns to the public and to policymakers. So the idea was putting the camera into the hands of the person for them to chronicle their experiences, their challenges, and then in a way bring them back to a community-based level where you could then you know uh, implore uh, policymakers and key stakeholders to understand the challenges that were there with a view to lobbying change. Um, and so it was really well intended and, and, and Wang and Burris, you know, while they didn't sort of explicitly kind of do health all the time, it was always, to my mind when I read their work, it was very implicit. It was kind of like social determinants of health, um, you know, in varying degrees um, and they really did focus on some of the more disenfranch disenfranchised subgroups, uh, often comprising women such as in this particular case with the with the Chinese example. So how have we used photo voice? Um, you know, when I first started out, um, my PhD was, was in prostate cancer and uh, I remember pretty much everyone saying to me that they were concerned that guys wouldn't talk to me about their prostate cancer. So there had been all this biomedical research um, uh, about prostate cancer, of its treatments, you know, the PSAs, all of those biomedical things that go with it. And, uh, you know, the, con the concern was we didn't really know enough about the illness experience. And uh, so I sort of was writing up a proposal for my PhD and I, I, I was just struck by, you know, photographs and, and how we might use visual methods. So much against the advice of my supervisor and pretty much everyone around me, I, I said, well, you know, I'm going to give these guys, back in the day, this was 2003, disposable, uh, disposable cameras. Um, so uh, that was kind of uh, uh, helpful, a uh, way of getting the guys to take photographs to detail their experience, um, uh, their experience of prostate cancer. Um, then we went on to do some work in, in dads uh, who smoke and then we have recently done some work in depression and suicide. So maybe just a little bit around the first little piece that we did in regards to men with prostate cancer. Um, it, it was an interesting study because we put the cameras, these disposable cameras in the hands of the men and, and, I, and I guess one of the things that we, we noticed really early on was that the guys showed us a lot more than what we thought we were really going to see. So it was quite interesting. So this first picture I share with you, um, the narrative that goes with this is uh, that's the place where you don't want to go. Not yet anyway. I'm not ready and I cheated that place. Now I can drive past it instead of being carried in there. 
So that's the cemetery. That is my route home from the pool. Every day I go past there. I also had a tune that I played called One Day at a Time by Hawkins Brothers. I'd play that over and over and over. Just take one day at a time. I don't believe in heaven or hell. I don't think I can. And yet amazingly, when I felt crook, that's an Australian word for sick, I talked to God a few times. But whether he's there, I don't know. I had a bit of a chat with him. So they're kind of, it's just a lovely example of how rich the narrative gets threaded in and around this photograph of the cemetery. Uh, a guy who's been diagnosed with prostate cancer, treated for prostate cancer, and just the unsurety uh, that follows him uh, around the uncertainty of his, uh, his likelihood to survive or not. So again, it just takes you into a, a different place with the guys and really uh, we were kind of, uh, it was like an elixir for talk, you know, the guys really talked a lot. The other thing we noticed, as in this photograph, is that they did show us a lot more than what we thought we would get. So um, it was an ethnographic study and, you know, we pride ourselves on uh, doing really good participant observations you know, and seeing things and analysing them and thinking about them. But in fact, what was happening here was that the guys were really controlling what we saw and how we saw it and putting it forward to us. So it was really um, quite surprising, at least for me, you know, in getting some of these photographs back. So the way it would work is I'd give them the camera, the guys would take the photographs. So I would then take the camera get the photographs developed and I would go and interview the guys with the photographs. So you never really knew exactly what you were getting, um, you know, until you had the, had the film developed. And so with this bottom one, it's, a, it's really, it's a narrative about incontinence. And so uh, this guy is a lawyer uh, who was in his 50s and uh, had been, uh, had undergone prostatectomy and had experienced some degree of, uh, of incontinence. And it just says here, um, his narrative that goes with this. I, I started off with a bigger one than that. Um, it was more like a nappy, uh, but after a while, uh, I got to I got to lose those uh, because I was fine. Uh, just a little pouch, and I was able to use these for a month or so, and then I went back to work. So his narrative is actually about recovery. Uh, and again, you know, it's kind of interesting because when you look at the photograph, you might not necessarily think that. So again, the way the captions match up to the particular photographs is incredibly important. Um, so that was kind of our first pass at it. Um, when I got to Canada in 2003, I did some work with Joan Batorf and, and it was around smoking and we were interested in, you know, dads and smoking. And so again, we, we really applied the same framework. It was we'd meet the guys, we'd talk to them about taking some photographs about their favourite smoking places. And these were dad, these were guys who were either their, their partner was in pregnancy or, or just just had a little uh, little child. And so uh, it was kind of interesting. They were smoking, uh, smoking, um, and then really just chronicling their favourite places to smoke. Um, so they went off, took photographs, and then we interviewed them. I mean, the, the thing that struck us from the outset was we couldn't believe how many photographs came back that were of cars. And so again, in the context of the, all these car pictures coming back, it was at a time when um, the guys were driving to and from work and they were smoking in, a, in what we call transit smoking. You know, and oftentimes there'd be two car families, so it wasn't like they were smoking in the car with the child in tow or their partner. So it was often their work car. So it's so kind of interesting and revealing from that point of view because not very long after um, the, these findings sort of were published, uh, there was uh, some legislation here in, in British Columbia uh, about not being able to smoke in a car with a child under the age of 15 years. So it's kind of, it was kind of interesting and, and again, the photographs really was something, because I'm not entirely sure that we would have picked it up in the narrative of the interviews when guys talked about cars and going to and from work, but it was just so visible in the pictures that, that vehicles really did feature in, in their smoking. So not to belabor the, the kind of uh, the results of this study, but to say that 
up until this point in time for us, we'd sort of been doing this, what I call a scrapbook effect. So it would be like we would get a theme and we would give perhaps a photograph within a particular article to document the theme. And so it was like a scrapbook, you know, like here's a picture, here's the theme. And I wanted to do a little bit more with the photographs. Um, I wanted to think more comprehensively about the photographs. So we came up with this, uh, this four-part process that we thought could be helpful. Um, I, I don't by any means claim to have captured what this should be, but this was our first pass of it and it did help us. So just to say in terms of preview, what we did is we, we view each picture with a corresponding narrative to understand the intended readings from the participants' perspective. So we really privileged you know, what they were saying. So literally just match it up, uh, the picture and the, and the direct narrative. Um, and then we did a thing called review. And that was where we sort of like, as a researcher, our reading of the photograph and the narrative. And really what we were looking for was culture, you know, these cultural inputs, because again, this was an ethnographic piece. But we were also really interested in looking for discord. So this picture that I'm sharing with you here underneath review is an interesting one because it's an example of an oppositional reading. So the 27-year-old carpet cleaner, um, he states that since the birth of his baby, he's not smoked inside the family home and that um, uh, at home his smoking is confined to an outside balcony. So his narrative was strongly aligned to these kind of dominant cultural ideas about acceptable smoking places. However, in this photograph, you know, revealed as an ashtray in his living room, uh, a room that he describes as his favourite relaxation area. Uh, and the participant explained that he'd staged the photograph, having poured cigarette ash from his outdoor ashtray to create a living a living room prop. So one of the interviews, one of the interviewers noted that. Uh, when we were at the house, because we did the interviews at the house, the house did smell, you know, quite strongly of tobacco smoke. Uh, when talking to the participants, you know, uh, female partner, um, we also learned from the female partner uh, that the couple smoked marijuana in the house, um, but it was not considered as contravening uh, upon the self-imposed rules to smoke outside. So the contradictions between the fieldwork observations, the photographs and the participant narratives, you know, they kind of demonstrated how strong social discourses about responsible parenting can contest ordinarily private spaces and make necessary the denial of slippages. So in addition, I, I think differentiating between marijuana and, and tobacco smoking is likely informed by dominant West Coast Canadian cultures that accept and, and in many ways, you know, probably idealise smoking marijuana while policing and stigmatising cigarette smoking. So again, it's not, not, I'm not suggesting there's a, there's a truth in, in our reading. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that there's oftentimes room for multiple readings and in going beyond preview to review, you know, we could sort of start to engage some of that piece as well. The other piece that we were really interested in was, was this cross photo uh, cross comparison. So again, our idea was that, that really, um, that we look at the photographs by themselves as a whole and really try to understand some of the thematic pieces within the photographs. Because it always felt like with the scrapbook approach, you did, you know, you'd have three themes in a paper and then you'd have three photographs representing those themes. And I just wondered whether we could do something a little bit different within that context. So we put all the photographs out. And again, this was the one where uh, if it hadn't been obvious already, it became really obvious that cars were a central smoking place for guys, um, you know, in the context of being dads who smoke. And, and again, it was really, really helpful to put all those photographs out. I think something like 25% of the 300 were of vehicles uh, and, and the context in which they were used for smoking. So again, just another way, maybe a cross-checking, um, but also uh, really engaging the, the images uh, as a standalone, uh, not, notwithstanding the idea that we did have a good understanding of the narrative that had been shared with the, with the interview data. And then the final process in that is theorising and really that just involves going back to the framework. So in this particular article, um, 
uh, we kind of we looked at uh, a Bordeauxian uh, piece around space and place, but also uh, incorporated Connell's masculinities work, the plurality of masculinity. So again, get sick on description, and then come back into some theory to colour it up in in terms of bookending where you said you were going in the first place. And again, I think photographs are terrific for gender. I think they're also terrific for place and space, as you can see, you know, uh, with these contested spaces here around smoking and the justification that can go with some of that. In part, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice article if, you, if you're wanting to do more with photographs or think a little bit differently about photographs. And like I say, I don't think it's got all the answers. Um, like most of the things we write, it's a kind of, it, even when they're published, they're like works in progress and thoughts in progress. Um, with the men um, who smoked, the dads who smoked, we also did one other thing in the interview, and that was we inserted these different uh, anti-smoking campaigns, uh, just simple pictures, um, and and asked them what their reading of those those pictures were, in terms of whether it would influence their smoking practices or not. And the reason we did this is because. You know, we wanted to get into interventions ourselves, and then we'd see so many of these kind of like these interventions that would be image based, and we'd wonder about the empirical grunt in terms of what informed them, but also the evaluation at the back end of, you know, what was their purpose if they were pre contemplative, contemplative, you know, what were we actually trying to measure here in terms of their evaluation of their, their input. So I, it was, I think it was 30 some. Uh, dads who we asked to look at these different uh, these different um, images around things that might help them to think about quitting smoking. So the first one I'm sharing with you there is from the NHS out of the UK and it's the Emotional Consequences Campaign and it targeting, it was really targeting dads, you know, it was very much about letting them know that their, um, their smoking had, had uh, consequences for the child, you know, in utero, and uh, and the text with this was, you can already hear, kick, and breathe in daddy's cigarette smoke. The next one is one, again, from NHS, and this was called the Dad Campaign. They've done a similar thing with the Mum Campaign, so they had a Mum version of this. But the Dad one was, the caption was, giving up the only way to protect your family from the effects of smoking. Don't give up giving up. That was kind of nice. Um, this one was interesting too. Um, it was a true story, um, apparently, from uh, from Florida, and it was a, a truth ad. And this is Lee Kurz, a 34-year-old man, who's uh, who was a heavy smoker and died of a severe cancer in multiple sites. And of course, you can see his family um, uh, on the side there. Um, and it was published by a, a bunch of newspapers. Uh, Time magazine ran it in 1999. You know, so it was a kind of a, a, a true story, if you like, a testimony. This one played on the ideas that impotence could motivate you to think about quitting. Um, and the caption with this one was interesting too. Um, if you won't give up smoking for your lungs, heart or throat, maybe you'll do it for your penis. Um, and of course, there's no empirical evidence about the connection between smoking and uh, erectile dysfunction. But I don't think that matters sometimes. Um, and the last one here was from Canada, and it was called Go 100%. Uh, it was really a youth campaign. And uh, the idea of going 100% across the spokes there, Go Smoke Free, uh, I think is, is forcing a, a kind of an idea around performativity or not, uh, in terms of smoking or, or not smoking. So again, we put these, we laid these out one by one, and, uh, and and I'll cut to the chase in terms of what they endorsed as most influential for them. Uh, it was the the dads one. It was uh, uh, the uh, the dad campaign, giving up the only way to protect your family from the effects of smoking. So really trades on masculine ideals about you know doing help for somebody else and doing it in, you know doing it to benefit someone else because it's a virtue to protect. And to provide, so you know th that kind of talked most of the guys. Interestingly, just as just in brief, was to say that they didn't necessarily fully understand that, that was a fetus in utero with the first one. They couldn't necessarily see the picture there and the connection. And and I think you know that was that was a reasonable observation. 
Ironically, in terms of the, the true story, that was the one that they had most difficulty believing in terms of the validity. And I think, you know, because it was so severe um, and because a, a lot of shock tactics have been used in cigarettes and, and anti-smoking, you know, probably probably did, uh, you know, strike a bit of a chord with them or get a bit of a, a reaction, which was to dismiss its validity rather than in, engage the, the actual story. Um, they refuted that they had any issue around erectile dysfunction. And fair enough, you know, they've just become dads, you know, their virility is really not in question. And the go 100%, they didn't really feel like it was necessarily a message for them. So again, just another example of how you might think about inserting photographs, you know, into, into interviews. And so we had participant produced photographs, but we also had these photographs. Um, and I'm sure we could name that as a particular method as well, although we didn't, we stopped sure of that. But just to say, you know, it doesn't have to be either or. The full study is, uh, uh, it, it, we wrote this one with, um, with Joy Johnson um, and the readings of uh, Smoking Fathers, a reception analysis of tobacco cessation images. And again, you know, it's a, it's a nice little uh, idea around how to, how to engage other, uh, other photo efforts or, or methods. Um, and the interesting thing too is we, we kind of claimed a semiotics analysis in this. Um, none of us had an art background, although Karen LeBeau did, the last author, and she sort of helped us. And, and the semiotics was really a, a bit of a different feel because we had to do the very thick description of all of those, uh, all of those images and then do the analysis around what the guys had contributed towards each one of those photographs. So again, I can talk a little bit more about that at the end if it's, uh, if it's of interest to people. Our most recent work is, uh, is Man Up Against Suicide. And so um, with this particular um, area, what we've done is um, we were very interested in men's depression and suicide. And the reason that we got interested in suicide was we did all of these interviews with men who experienced depression, either diagnosed formally with depression or else um, self-identifying with depression. And honestly, without um, any exception, every one of those guys mentioned suicide at some level, uh, be it suicidal thoughts, be it uh, issues about uh, self-harm and so we sort of became interested in, in, in really trying to chronicle some of the issues around male suicide. Not easy to do and so we um, recruited women who'd lost a man to suicide and we recruited uh, men who'd lost a man to suicide and we asked them to take photographs uh, of their experience of that loss and we were quite prescriptive that we, we kind of wanted to understand their ideas about suicide prevention as well. So we didn't want it to be, we wanted it to be authentic, cathartic, but at the same time point towards solution um, rather than get caught in, in, as you can imagine, you know, the, the grief and loss associated with that, with, with that loss. Um, and the other thing we did is we got cameras into the hands of men who had experienced suicidal thoughts in the past, plus or minus non-fatal suicidal behaviours. Um, so it was a it was pretty big project and this one's been funded by Movember so it was quite quite interesting um, to be able to do this work. Uh, I don't know where else we would have got this one funded because it was a little bit a little bit edgy I think. Um, I'll share with you uh, uh, a video in a moment and it's just it has a little bit of music at the background. Um, and it just kind of uh, it gives an idea about some of the KT pieces. And, and I want to talk about this just a little bit, just to say that our feeling over, over our period of time in using visual methods is that the knowledge translation hasn't been quite as good as it could be. And we've really tried hard with this particular project to make the uh, a selection of the photographs and the captions that go with those photographs available to, um, to people uh, to create the space to have a conversation about what is a pretty tough topic being uh, being uh, male suicide. Um, so I'll just, I'll share this uh, this with you. I hope it works. <laughs> Thank you. 
see that um, it's uh, it's been a really interesting project to do um, certainly very different from uh, anything we'd ever done before part of what we did too with the photographs is that we provided the opportunity for some of the participants to come in and actually work with a an artist a guy called Foster Eastman who had his own gallery and um, it was kind of interesting you know we did these Saturday workshops and of course really therapeutic value in having those conversations and working together on producing these couple of installations or this, these couple of kind of 3D pieces, um, sorry, not 3D, but, but rather layered pieces where they put photographs on top of photographs and you put a resin in between them. Um, as you can tell, I'm not an artist, but uh, that's what we were doing in, in a rough sense. And then what um, Foster did with three of the participants in particular was work on some 3D installations. So this, uh, the middle one is, is uh, it's got some drug paraphernalia and it's a story of a, a guy who was caught in the downtown east side here in, in, in Vancouver and was quite suicidal for a period of time and survived and that was his story. So it was a, a 3D installation for that. Um, the one across there was uh, a story of a guy who saved his mate or his buddy um, from suicide and uh, it was like uh, he suggested it was like a bungee rope pulling pulling his uh, pulling his friend back from suicide. Uh, that's the second one there. So there's a whole bunch of bungee ropes kind of in that 3D installation. And down at the bottom, uh, there's a there's a kind of a picture. Uh, it, it's meant to represent an, uh, it, it does represent rather uh, an outhouse uh, where one of the guys took his life, and it was a story. That was shared by one of the female participants, and that unexpected loss, and and, uh, and some of the issues around that. So it was a really, it was quite a an amazing kind of event. It, it actually stayed in a in a gallery for a month here in Vancouver, and since that time, we've been to um, Rimby, a little town where the suicide rate is really high amongst the young men, 
um, and run an exhibition there. We've been to Edmonton. We did World Suicide Prevention Day. We were invited out to a funeral home here in Vancouver. So we're in Winnipeg next year from May 15th for a month and we're in Ottawa the year after that in 2016. So it's, it's been a fascinating kind of collection of photographs, really powerful. Um, and it's it's kind of, we've never shared so much from a photo boy study. Um, not easy. Um, it's been it's been a pretty tough topic, um, I think, for everyone involved. And uh, we've done 60 interviews, and uh, we're just sort of uh, working very much now on the on the nonce translation part of that, which is which is exhibitions. Um, just to mention on this slide as well, we've got a stand. Like we took it, we t I took nine of the photographs. I had a keynote in Leeds, and I took nine of the photographs there and had them on display and. You know, it was really sweet. The organisers um, and the administrators at, at Leeds University, Leeds Metropolitan University, said they'd like to keep the nine photographs on permanent display, uh, which is a, a real, you know, just an amazing, uh, an amazing request, and we're so pleased to be able to do that. So, um, Leeds Metropolitan has changed their name to Leeds Beckett, so we have a we have nine photographs that are there at Leeds Beckett University on permanent display. The, the funeral home one was really a kind of an interesting event because, of course, there was a lot of people there who were survivors, and I think you know, fair to say, there was a lot of injuries in the room as well, and and so the photographs were uh, they sort of filled a different space that night because it's not so much about art, it's about you know experience, I believe. Um, and of course, this other one over at Rimby uh, on the side here was uh, we were solicited by um, two young girls who had lost their brothers to suicide, they'd heard about the Man Up Against Suicide Project and they asked us if we would go to Rimby, it's a little town uh, outside of uh, Edmonton. And um, so uh, Jen Critchen, a postdoc who works uh, works with me, um, and Christina Hahn, a doctoral student who works with me, they did the interviews up in Rimby and then we had an event and we ran for four days up there. And it was unbelievable. It was just uh, got a lot of people in the in the space, got those conversations going again, and um, just really powerful event. Um, and again, I think you know it's important to to get these conversations. It's also online, um, and it's at uh, the web. The website is manupagainstsuicide.ca, and we've got a whole bunch of the photographs that are online there, along with the captions. We have a 16-minute documentary which tells the, really the full story of the project so far, uh, as well as the little clip that hopefully you saw that I just played with the music at the back of it. And so again, we're trying really, really hard to do uh, our very best in terms of making these images available, telling the stories, um, and we've sort of stepped off kind of the writing of manuscripts on this project and, and really privileged the data in terms of the, the getting the photographs out there and you know plenty of time to write from the from the full data but um, but we've really really focused on the knowledge translation being for the people. LC 300 was passed in November of 2012 and it is a bill that looks at suicide prevention in this country and I think it's high time that we did try and lobby you know people to have conversations about um, suicide, men and women, um, and, and we focused on men because it's four times the rate of women's suicide. But I've got to say, uh, it, when you look at the epidemiology of suicide in Canada, uh, there is a rise amongst women. So again, you know, it doesn't have to be one or the other. Uh, I think it can be, it can be really, you know, talking about. Um, I think there's lots of pros. Clearly, I think there's lots of pros about why we use photographs and how we use them. You know, I think they're good currency. I think what they do is they engage people. Whenever we present the photographs, it's almost like we get this secondary, third, and fourth analysis. We just get people with different ideas about what the images say, and of course, that's part of the beauty of them because they can actually say things to people in different ways, and they can prompt different kind of conversations. And there is no one truth in the in the images, so I think it has given voice to some stigmatised issues as far as we're concerned around smoking and around the suicide. I'm not sure if we've emancipated people or not. You know, you always hope that you give people a voice that might not have had it, um, and that you can then sustain that voice and get it into the hands of policymakers. 
uh, and again, uh, that's the ideal of participatory action research. And, and of course, it, it is what we kind of start out with. Um, you know, it, it, those ideas. Uh, the RIMBY event was probably the closest, I think, that we've actually come to a, a fully participatory action research design, and that was kind of iterative and, and lucky enough to have enough trim in the budget to be able to do that. The cons, um, you know, I guess privacy issues uh, are, one of the, are one of the things, you know, so with ethics, you know, we had to be very clear that, that you know, if we were going to, we're going to ask people to share their stories, but we didn't really want to sanitise their stories and we didn't want to censor their stories. So we had to be authentic and we had to be true to the method. And that was not always easy. Uh, you notice that one with the mum holding the placard up. We agonised over that one a lot. Um, same with the sister. And uh, went back to them a number of times and, and they were very, very clear that they wanted their images in and of course ethics, we, we had the ethics first to do it, but you know, again, it's, it's one of those ones where you kind of check in with people because you know, feelings change and then people have different relationships to the deceased as well and they might not necessarily want it to be known. So, you know, there's a few things to, to really think about in terms of that. Um, I guess the cost of, of photo voice is, is another thing to, to maybe think about, you know. The KT arm of this is 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 really a big pull on the budget, and if you don't, a lot of times you don't build it in up front because you can't quite see it, can't quite see what it's going to be, and uh, and I just say that you know that that can be one of those emerging costs where you're suddenly kind of caught looking for looking for additional dollars to really share this data that you've got. Uh, that'd be a couple of the cons. Um, in terms of KT2, um, I want to share this paper. Genevieve Pritchin, is, uh, she did a PhD and I, I was lucky enough to be able to supervise her and um, it, it was about the death of a, a male friend and it was male grief and uh, masculine identities. Um, I share this one with you for a couple of reasons. One is I think, I think Genevieve Pritchin is, is going to be one of the, the great researchers in Canada um, it, using this method. I think she's... Uh, Terrifically strong, and, and and we're seeing it again with her work in the Man Up Against Suicide project. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm putting her forward as someone to watch um, because she's gonna she's gonna be terrific, and she already is. But also, social science and medicine, for the very first time in their history, um, published a paper that's got photographs in it, and it's Genevieve Pritchens, and I'm lucky enough to be on it as well. But it's, I think, it says something about knowledge translation now that we're starting to find journals that will publish images because when I finished with my PhD in 2003 4 it was really difficult to find journals that would publish images and I guess part of it's about online and everything like that that it's easier to reproduce the images now but I think this one with social science and medicine just sort of suggests that even if journals don't necessarily say that they would publish something that's got photographs um, it might be that with the right paper and a strong enough emphasis on the need to include the photographs that you might be able to lobby to, uh, to break some of those restrictions around everything being so text-based. Um, again, I just want to close out by saying um, thank you. I really hope the audio has been okay and I hope that the video came through and uh, I'd be delighted to field any questions. Thank you very much, John. In fact, we do have a question here, uh, and I'm going to give the microphone to Laura Marcos. Marco, uh, Laura, I hope that you have a working microphone. Let me try. Laura? No, she doesn't, seems to me. Uh, therefore, I will read the question, okay? And the no. question by uh, Laura is... Uh, let me see. Yes. Um, let me see. I will read this. She said the following. Thanks, thanks so much. Several questions. I would appreciate more background on how you framed the instructions request to participants as to what you wanted uh, photos of and how you balance staying on topic with the risks of directing the photo data outcomes per se. Second. If you could talk about the research ethics issues of photos versus anonymity, etc., 
for example, including others who might appear in a photo yet, yet not have provided consent. So that's what she wrote, and then she followed up with the following. Uh, any advice on the types of topics best fit for this method? For example, those you have discussed today are emotional uh, laden, life death issues. Yeah. Wow. Okay. There's three great questions. <laughs> I'll try to be succinct. So, our instructions are usually, uh, we, it, it is a delicate balance, you know, because you want. You know, you really want people to tell you what's important to them, so you don't want to preempt the, the the exact kind of uh, things you want in terms of pictures. But you want to give them enough instruction to go by. And I don't know whether it's just men, but the guys in the smoking study, they really wanted some some instruction about what what we wanted because we started out. Our instruction to them at the beginning was take some photographs. <coughs> and Imagine that you're being um, paid to mount a photographic exhibition called Smoking Through the Eyes of Fathers. And the guys just glazed over and sort of went, oh, mm, don't know what you mean, you know. So really what they were after was something more. And so we went back to them and said, okay, take some photographs about the places where you, your favourite places to smoke. Talk about some places that are kind of difficult places to smoke where you used to smoke, you know. So, so give us some of those kind of things to, to help us understand some of the challenges around being a dad who smokes. And so we reframed it. So, so one of the things I'd say is that in terms of instruction, I think, you know, don't hesitate to put out your best instruction and, and leave it nice and open at the first, you know, pass. And then if you get those first couple interviews back where you're kind of feeling like they're not getting it or they're actually soliciting you for more, then reconvene, get your amendments into ethics, you know, detailing what, you, what your instruction will be, you know, um, because I, I think it does vary by topic. But, you, you, you know, you do want it to be what's important to them. And I mean, like the experience of prostate cancer was pretty easy, um, but some of those guys came back with, just photographs you would never have anticipated. So some of them actually took real embodiment photographs, you know, of, of their bodies in relation to erectile dysfunction and things. And we really weren't expecting that. So again, you know, I try to keep it open, but at some level you, you might want to be prescriptive. Photographs, in terms of third party, um, when someone takes a photograph of someone else, so our instructions, depending on what project we're talking about, our instructions would be that, you know, if you are going to take a photograph of somebody else, um, and we're and we're going to include photographs that, that that show people's identity, then you know, here's the here's an additional consent form that you would get them to sign off and uh, as a waiver. So then there's a couple of things. One is that the copyright reverts to you in terms of the person who's taken the photograph, but also as a secondary piece, people in the photograph agree for that to be shared in a public space and that might be within a journal article or it might be online um, and so there's a there's kind of a third party piece around that um, uh, and again you know I think with good ethics you should ask you should really ask what you want you should you should give it your best pitch at ethics to say what what it is you truly want to do because I think a lot of times with I, I know in my early stuff I'd really wish that I'd said that I you know, could I just publish these guys' faces if they wanted to be known? Uh, and of course, I didn't do that. I uh, short anonymity. And so again, I'd just say, you know, depending on your topic, really think about what it is you want in terms of being able to share at the back end of all of this. And then the third part about topic, I just say, you know, um, the, the depression and suicide is a good one because it's a, it's a condition of interiority, and a, and you would. I think reasonably argued that of the smoking and probably the prostate cancer as well in the way that we pitched what we would like them to talk to. Um, but my honest belief is that photo voice is good for anything. It is, it, you know, um, I, I just, I'm enamored with the idea that, that we could have some words connected to photographs to help us just convey some of the findings, um, to be the elixir for, for talk. So I don't think it has to be all about interiority and what people are feeling and their emotions. I, I think there are other more kind of mechanistic kind of issues that we could look at.
um, systematic issues, you know, in terms of healthcare provision and the uptake of that. So I'm, I'm sure that we could we could be creative in it doing um, a lot of things because uh, it's I believe it's a really robust method. Okay, thank you, John. I have two more questions here. Uh, one from Natalie. Natalie, it seems that you don't have a microphone. That's what you said here. Uh, so let me read it for you, okay? Um, she said the following. I am working on a project about care mapping. Care maps are visual maps that show all the people and places and resources needed to support children with complex medical needs. We train caregivers on how to make, draw, care maps. Part of our challenge now is how to code the care maps. With visuals, do you code the visuals themselves as standalone images, or do you code in conjunction with the traditional interview transcripts? Okay. Yeah. So it's a it's a really good question. Um, it goes back. I, I don't know if you can see my screen again now, but um, it, yes, we it do. Goes back, okay. So it goes back to this this one. It doesn't have to be. And either or, Natalie, you can you can think about it uh, about how it's going to work best for you. So, for example, I would always do the preview where you match up the narrative with the with the photograph on that care map. I, I would do that, and then I'd look a little bit critically at it in terms of what my readings might be and whether there's a discord there or what that says about the culture of caregiving. And you could stop there, but the risk when you stop there is that you end up with the themes because you're looking at the narrative data and then you're probably going to pick out one of the photographs to illustrate you know, that, that it also was represented in, in the visual. The cross photo comparison, if you get through those first two stages and you put all the photographs out and, you, and, and you're so familiar with the data that you remember exactly kind of where those photos were inserted into the narratives and vice versa, then you can probably, you know, be a little bit more fully engaged with the photographs in terms of looking at the weight of the themes in terms of what is there, some things that, that come through in, in terms of care mapping. And then of course, you know, if it's if it's about caregivers, you know, then you're probably trading on a particular theory, you, you know, and then, you know, with those three parts in place, you, you can probably thicken up the analysis with a with a theorising around your findings as they're kind of to thicken up the description around the findings. But you know, uh, it's nice to get into the photograph. So I recommend you know this paper as you know selfless um, uh, selfless uh, self promotion if you like. Okay. But, but it might help you to think about that it doesn't have to be either or. or you might take one of those four steps and go, gee, that works best for this project. Thank you, John. One more question and we finish. We have three more minutes to go. And the question is, is from, uh, let me see, uh, Natalie asked that question now. Now is Kathy. And Kathy wrote the following, Kathy Banks. Um, Thank you, John, for your very interesting talk. I do not have a mic. Okay, but I would like to ask you this anyways. Okay, and this is what she's asking. I would like to ask you to explain how to how you came to the Man Up logo for depression. That is, what did this phrase mean to the men who were drawn to participate in your study? So, Kathy, it's a great question. Um, so, we've been getting a little bit of heat about this, um, so to speak. Um, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, so. Men, 